Our next speaker is Daniel Schubert, uh, who is, uh, I think, at the moment working in Würzburg, if I'm right. Yeah? And you are the author, or the editor, the author of a book on Durkheim in German. The first book, is that correct? It was. It was. <laughs> All right. Um, and Daniel has prepared a talk on law from myth. I asked him earlier if he's going to talk about law, and he said no. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, law from myth, symbolic dimensions of law in Serbia. Yeah. So over to you. Thank you very much. For Thank you. I'm humbled to participate in this venue. To the organizers, many thanks for having me from the heart. Um, I hope I'm not exceeding your level of concentration uh, by inviting you to on a trip to another different symbolic cultural universe, um, which, well, is rarely tackled by macro history or macro sociology so far. So still, I think we still have to develop languages and concepts to even deal with this matter. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is it. Uh, let me start by... Uh, uh, this is post. I don't find... Uh, find. Yeah, please uh, have a look at the current national anthem of Serbia and uh, even from the mere title uh, Borje Pravde, you get basically uh, the basic point of my presentation. Uh, it means obviously that when we talk about law, I want to talk, talk about law in, uh, in Serbia, uh, we have to talk about religion. And um, so in several senses, uh, well, this current, well, this, please mind, this has only been established in and introduced in 2006 and 2007 in the, in the legal process. Uh, so the, still this tackles, or this summarizes my genuine point. So what you can see is at first that, well, it doesn't make really sense to distinguish between religion and law in this context. Second, well, if you look closely enough, uh, that uh, semantically uh, the hymn uh, refers to the so-called Kosovo myth, or what I will try to introduce as <coughs> Kosovsky Savet, uh, the Kosovo Pledge. Um, well, and third, that uh, definitely this narrative harks back to, well, 1389. Uh, and, uh, well, there we have our, our conundrum, and just maybe I should go on by indicating what social science have. Uh, does have to say about Serbia so far. Um, social science has been engaged in producing so-called tropes of exotism when it comes to Serbia. Uh, I will not read that uh, in, in to full extent, but uh, still, it, you should get a glimpse that for Hamid and Pavlakovic, two very famous uh, uh, scholars in the field, Serbia fascinates us because it occupies the twilight zone between democracy and authoritarianism. It seems to be a land which hatches conspiracies and cabals. It is a society, important sectors of which are in denial, not just of the extent of Serbs' responsibility for the war, not just for ordinary Serbs' complicity in the atrocities committed in Kosovo, and not just for the illegitimacy of the Greater Serbia project, but, for some people, of liberalism itself, a society in which denial is mainstream, in which nationalism still tends to be viewed as positive, <laughs> in which there has been a sense of crisis in the air for most of the part of the past century, is a society in which movement forward towards stable democracy can only be difficult. Um, they also portray Serbia as a black hole in Europe, as a land from the other side of the mirror, and uh, uh, such imaginations. Um, this is, as I said, it's. Uh, it's a picture that is portrayed by sociologists. Well, I'm not uh, trying to uh, refute all these images, but I definitely would ask to ask more for a more deeper cultural sociological grounding on how this can be the case. So the constellation is 
so from the sociological sense, most unlikely. How could it be possible that one a social unit can entirely be uh, uh, in the spell of, of a mythical narrative that talks back like more than 600 years ago? This is basically the conundrum that I deal with in my empirical works. And uh, yeah, uh, just to, to, to give you a little bit further information, um, the, the Serbian anthropologist Ivan Cholovic uh, displayed the history of how this accommodation between politics and culture was to come about a structure. It is not just a, a conjuncture, but it is, it is a mere structure. And uh, maybe I could invite you to think about any sociological depiction of any country where uh, uh, the whole uh, political logic is uh, uh, traced to one single mythical complex. Only one book comes to my mind, which is Clifford Gates' depiction of Negara, mm -hmm. uh, where, where it is, uh, the story is told that you know the whole state uh, is nothing but a, a, a reincarnation of a certain cultural script. And so we have a similar constellation here. I could maybe even step into the footsteps of uh, a work that was presented here, basically, on the inaugurational uh, conference to uh, uh, Law as Religion by Uriel Prokacha, who, uh, dealing with the question on why it is that uh, contemporary Russians still do not feel attracted by the idea of contract in the 20th century, and he resorts this question by dealing with the code displayed in iconic um, uh, uh, in the iconic art. So again, this uh, invites cultures, any cultural sociologist to take a look beyond law and to take a look at any other cultural realm, be it, be it uh, uh, painting, be it music, and be reminded that the whole concept of oral tradition has been developed by uh, Perry and Lord in the 1920s and 30s on the case of how uh, the so-called Kosovo myth has been transmitted by dint of a oral tradition by epic songs and poems. So this is basically the world we are dealing with. Uh, this doesn't make sense uh, to distinguish uh, uh, rationally between culture and politics as, as uh, Cholovic has showed us in, in diversity of uh, instances um, they all merge, they both merge together. And as I said, Bizeko said that there is not a single social realm which is void or which can be explained without reference to this uh, cultural matrix, let's say. Well, what makes this uh, very unlikely is, as I think William Sewell put it uh, most adequately, that it's not possible, it's sociologically wise to think that uh, a whole social unit can be, in the end, uh, be under the spell of uh, such uh, a strong cultural concept. Um, and as I said, my whole empirical work, which I will only tackle in, I hope, in this second part of my presentation, is trying to uh, at least indicate that. Um, let me make another hint when it comes to sociology. Um, and uh, you know that uh, the whole uh, South Slavic history is does not appear in any major macro-sociological or macro-historical uh, work that I know. It's not in Durkheim, it's not in Weber, of course, but still it is in another grounding figure of uh, legal sociology, which, is, which just tends to be uh, rediscovered, which is Eugen Ehrlich. Uh, and he at least hinted at everybody, uh, or at, uh, to sociologists that, and to lawyers, obviously, that we have to distinguish between two sources of legal norms, which is what he called living law and uh, which is obviously written law. And uh, well, what I'm dealing with in this presentation is definitely confined to the, if you want, the flip side of, of the written or the uh, statuary law, which is, uh, can be defined as a study as on uh, living law. Um, another indication of where we are um, although the new government, which is, you know, since 2000 supposed to be under democratic rule, uh, has been trying to transmit a legal reform, uh, basically in 2006 and 2007, but it is unanimous uh, opinion that this has only come due to a failure 
And the reasons uh, just show you that there are obviously still cultural discrepancies between the principle of Rechtsstaatlichkeit and, uh, well, that what has been uh, referred to in, in Serbia as uh, the sources of normative power. Uh, I find that quite intriguing to just can hint you at these discussions that are going on. A cl this clash of cultures can also be uh, uh, detected uh, um, uh, well in the observing how the Serbian society deals with the Hague. Obviously, uh, it is a, it casts a uh, interesting uh, debate among uh, legal theorists on well whether we have to reconceptualize our notion of guilt. And uh, especially when it comes to the Serbian case, one probably has to account that there are uh, that we have to apply uh, notions of guilt that are beyond the liberal individualist um, lineage. Let's say, uh, as I said, I can only give you slight hintages at uh, hints at uh, this debate. Um, yeah. Um, so. Uh, what could such an endeavor be worthwhile? I think that it's, as Roger Cottrell said, that um, it, such a study of a localized uh, living law is necessary and can be viewed as a correlate of juristic universalism, which just needed to prevent uh, a juristic science becoming socially out of touch. Uh, so I hope this gives enough reason, I mean, to spur a little bit more of your attention. Okay, uh, so let's say the journey begins, and uh, um, what I'm trying to do is now obviously to, to um, give you an impression on how the so-called cultural matrix, which has been developed around the Kosovo battle, uh, has emerged, uh, what it consists about, and how it has been transmitted even to the contemporary uh, Serbian society. Obviously. I have to confine myself to very few historical points, but, well, I hope it will make sense still. Um, before uh, the inauguration of the Kosovo myth, uh, uh, people in, in the Balkan Peninsula, they lived under uh, Justinian law, for instance. They did, like, uh, you know, every principal, principality had their uh, uh, applications of Justinian law, of Byzantine law, and um, uh, it is only after the conversion to Christendom in the 10th century uh, and due to the fact that the, they lived in larger groups that the first uh, yeah, juridical code was inaugurated by Tsar Dushan in the heyday of the Nemanjic era in the 13th century. Um, this is the first uh, legal code, let's say, and it's nothing, it comes down to nothing else but a Serbian retranslation of the Justinian code, you could say. So um, this is just a sort of uh, um, historical background, let's say, and um, the next chapter is already uh, um, the day that uh, of the Kosovo battle. Uh, you know, nothing much is robust uh, when it comes to what happened at the 28th of June in 1389, uh, except that the battle took place, that uh, the Serbian ruler uh, Tsar Lazar Hrebeljanovic on the one side and uh, the, the Turkish Sultan uh, Murat, they both were killed. But that's all, I mean, what is amazing that even the first reports on the battle reported a Serbian victory instead of a Turk instead of a defeat, which is somewhat striking. And uh, even to Central Europe, to Vienna, the first stories uh, 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 accounted the Serbs as a winner. So the question still is is really fascinating today, and uh, there are new, just a new book has been published about this question: What is the benefit of a, of introducing a traumatogenic narrative, uh, a victimological code around a obvious victory? Well, the way the the the, the Kosovo myth no, uh, gives nothing else but a legitimization of to the Serbs of. Uh, of uh, defeat, um, which is codified in, in part of the Serbian contemporary, contemporary code of arm, 
the so-called four letters C or the Cyrillic C and the Latin S stands for the slogan Samo uh, Sloga Serbina Spashava, which is like only unity can save the Serbs. This is a genuine uh, uh, lesson that the Serbs would have to learn from the defeat. The, uh, the, the story is obviously cast in a Christological fashion, that is, uh, Tsar Laza was uh, uh, asked by God in the uh, night before the battle how he will decide, will he go to war against the Turks, uh, super military superpower then, and die, or will he shy away and, uh, well, lead a life in under, 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 under Ottoman yoke. And definitely he decided, obviously, in the way that martyrs do. And the cult of Lazar stands for a martyr cult. Um, and uh, it is really coined about uh, along these Christological motives. Where are we? Yeah, just uh, put it short. Uh, it, the, in sum, you could summarize that uh, the mythical narrative would identify defeat at the Battle of Kosovo as the decisive turning point between independence and national servitude. Historically, it's, it's definitely not the case because uh, uh, the Serbian lands were divided 20 years before the battle took place and militarily, uh, uh, it is uh, Serbia as a state persisted for more than 70 years after the battle. So still, the question is uh, relevant. Um, be reminded that uh, under the Ottoman uh, regime, the Ottoman system, it has been, and this comes back to Laura's point, I think, the church that has been viewed as the only social organization that was able to transmit, and uh, uh, let's say the Serbian uh, worldview, if you want. Um, uh, they build up the so-called cult on, on Laza. The, they they uh, um, introduced and tried to strengthen the, the narrative of martyrdom. They want to spur uh, the urge to overcome the yoke by that. And uh, there are, of course, thousands of stories that uh, are that spread it into to Goethe and uh, uh, Grimm brothers uh, in the 17th century who were fascinated by these stories. And they repeat all the same, uh, this mart martyric story. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know how, how deep I have to delve into the Devshima system of, uh, applied by the Ottoman regime. However, it is a so-called division of labor, if you want. There were actually two legal systems applied on that realm. Uh, one part of the population were under the uh, Ottoman, which is Muslim jurisdiction. The other part were still under the influence of the Serbian Orthodox Church. And they cultivated, ob obviously, uh, a notion that, in moral terms, the Serbs were still superior uh, to, to, to Muslims because as uh, because Tsar Lazar chose uh, uh, the uh, existence in heaven uh, uh, and not uh, 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 you know living a life under uh, uh, suppression whatsoever. Um, it is this has been the case until the 18th nineteenth century when Serbia more and more aspired. Uh, uh, independence. Uh, it's been here that the so-called Kosovsky Sabbat uh, was, um, let's say, shaped in, in its final, still current uh, version. There has been one central motive amended, which is the notion of, um, well, of the covenant. Anthony D. Smith denoted uh, the Serbian type of nationhood uh, as a covenant nation. And this goes back to, to a story that obviously we know from other uh, uh, types of nas nationalism. Um, the motive is definitely that um, uh, as long as uh, the Serbs would continue to sacrifice their lives for the perseverance of the Serbs, the Serbian race, they would still be uh, the moral, big, the moral uh, uh, conqueror of the world. And this is why, as many other nations in this world, the Serbs until today 
when it comes to the mythological perceptions, depict themselves as the center of the world, and definitely not, a, not as a periphery. This comes really from, the, from this uh, well covenant idea that we know from other parts of the world. Um, and this, I think, so far, uh, with the history of ideas, um, I wanted to give you now at least, <coughs> well, an idea about how this was uh, transmitted. Uh, again, uh, epic songs, poems um, um, were the main medium by which these ideas were transmitted to further generations. Um, as I said, we won't have the time to delve deeper in, into it, just to give you an impression. Um, however, uh, now I, will, I would like to turn to the more ritualistic aspects of the transmission of uh, these ideas. I, can, I hope we might come back to that in the discussion. Yeah, here is the conclusion before I go to the more uh, you know, live, uh, lived experiences. The idea of the Kosovo pledge, you could say, then consists in the making of the subjective choice, not only in full awareness of its tragic consequences, but also in the knowledge that the choice determines the mythical meaning of the battles as crucial moments in the national cultural legacy and is necessary for upholding ethnic, not necessarily epic, honor. Okay, um, obviously this seems must seem to you like a, uh, I don't know, like a story from, from ancient times or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could not understand how a modern nation could still um, believe what they used to believe. Uh, however, um, these are just uh, portrayals that show you, if you want, some kind of the effervescent fervor uh, uh, on how um, uh, what these um, ideas could spur in soldiers, for instance. This is a depiction by Jovan Skerlich, uh, who described that there was not a song, toast, or speech that did not mention sad Kosovo, which was not yet avenged. We're talking about 19th century here. Um, and almost everybody had hallucinations of the Kosovo battlefield with its dead bodies, and the Kosovo girl, which is a uh, widespread motive of uh, uh, Kosovo songs tending to the fallen heroes. And in t even in the uh, latest Balkan Wars, you find reports by soldiers that, that uh, show you that they obviously felt they were not alone. The old ancestors stood up from their graves and uh, stood by their sides, for instance. This is, well, if you want magical thinking, uh, definitely. But uh, it is at least uh, reported. Um, here's another, probably, if, if we talk about uh, the Tukhemian concept of ritual, um, this is probably the, the most, it's not an intellectual, but it's, a, it's another appraisal given by a soldier. The single sound of that word, Kosovo, caused an indescribable excitement. This one word pointed to the black past five centuries. My God, what awaited us to see a liberated Kosovo? When we arrived at Kosovo Polje and the battalions were placed in order, our commander spoke, brothers, my children, my sons, this place on which we stand is the graveyard of our glory. We <coughs> bow to the shadows of fallen ancestors, uh, ancestors and pray God for the salvation of their souls. <coughs> we feel so strong and proud for we are the generation which will realize the centuries-old dream of the whole nation that we, with the sword, will regain that freedom that was lost with the sword. Um, by this time, also, the so-called Vidovdan, the commemoration day of the Battle of Kosovo, was not formally, but still uh, habitually introduced. And uh, there you see just the uh, so-called developed habitual, um, I don't know, political meaning of the state, uh, um, just these uh, well, main points of Serbian history, they all were uh, taking place at the Kosovo day, at the beat of time.
Well, as I said, I could talk, must, 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 even must talk for hours about, uh, to give you a, a clear-cut notion that this is not just ideas, but it is, let's say, lived experience. On any core political historical point, the Serbian leaders referred back to the Kosovsky Savit, to the Kosovo Pledge, and reminded the Serbs that they would have to be ready to sacrifice their lives for the sake of uh, heavenly survival, moral survival. Even, uh, well, one of the last infamous points of, of this discourse was uh, well, Slobodan Milosevic's um, announcement uh, on the occasion of the 1600s anniversary of uh, the Kosovo battle, where he uttered that Still, the main gist of the Kosovsky Savet, if we lost the battle, then this was not only the result of social superiority and the armed advantage of the Ottoman Empire, but also of the tragic disunity in the leadership of the Serbian state at that time. The lack of unity and betrayal in Kosovo will continue to follow the Serbian people like an evil fate through the whole of its history. Uh, well, as I said, this mythical complex, let's say, is transmitted into contemporary modern Serbian law. As I said, it has only been installed in 2006-2007 by a, at least, uh, proverbial democratic regime. Um, and if I, could, I probably should uh, talk about the um, Assigns here more, more deeply, they all hark back to the Nemanjic era. You have the four letter C in the coat of arms. Um, you have obviously a hint at the uh, royal dynasties uh, of Serbian, the ruled in Serbian history, and so forth. Um, well, to sum it up with Tim Judah, in all of European history, it is impossible to find any comparison with the effect of Kosovo on the Serbian national psyche. Um, well, yes, now it depends how much time I got. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to say, if you want to be in time, you have no time. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we can, you know, go a little over, which Werner says we can, then you have... It's just, I, can, I think I can make the main, main point clear here. Yeah. Ten minutes or... Thank you. Uh, um, my point is obviously not uh, to consent into the majority of social scientific approaches that really see the, the, the fateful destiny that of Serbian society over the last 20, 30 years is related to the incapacity to overcome this mythical thinking. I, uh, this would be too easy an explanation. I think that we have to apply other theoretical, more, more, more detailed theoretical means by explaining how definitely myth comes into life, especially when it comes to the mobilization of civil war. And still, here we can apply, uh, or at least I'm applying, Durkheimian concepts, for instance, that show us that, uh, well, the way that cultural ideas are transmitted and actualized uh, is a much more complex thing than many of uh, especially political scientific um, uh, explanations suggest. Um, well, yeah, uh, the word wound culture uh, is often applied to the uh, Serbian society since the 1990s. And, um, well, yeah, it definitely harks back to the victimological narrative implied in the Kosovo myth but still goes a little bit further. It uh, tries to uh, hint that we need to detect a so-called um, defective public sphere, a public sphere that is um, focused on images of deaths, of uh, victims, uh, violence, uh, and so forth. And we could only, at least in my work, I try to come to glimpse with that by analyzing Serbian movies. I would like to talk about that, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm afraid I, can, I cannot do that here. Um, instead, I would maybe uh, hint you that, that uh, the concept that has been re-established by Mestrovic, but 
more or less closely sticking to Durkheim and the concept of anime. I think um, if, we, if, we, if we try to come to glimpse how the civil war was possible from the Serbian point of view, we would have to see the effects of, um, well, the perception of a normic society. Uh, obviously, we have, we, at least I, uh, in this line, can draw a line from, ranging from Durkheim's suicide over Mary Douglas's uh, um, ideas on pollution until Apadurai's uh, uh, anthropology, uh, uh, anthropology of globalization that hints at the, at the fatal effect that the spreading of stories uh, and unsecure, uh, uncertainty, the effect that these stories can have on people's behavior. And uh, I try to uh, analyze or to go back to statistical um, indications that I find, could find in Serbia in the times before the war that show there's nothing like uh, ethnic distance. And when it comes to the level of ethnic distance, the Serbian society was even uh, in better shape than uh, modern Western societies at that time. So all the social scientific parameters show that, uh, I mean, when it comes to civil standards, Serbian society ranked quite high in, on the European scale. So it is only, uh, well, this has been often coined a sort, sort of dark spot on Serbian history. The years uh, bef before the war, before the outbreak of the war, what happened? Obviously, Milosevic launched a detailed um, uh, media campaign to, if, if I may say so, re-traumatize Serbian uh, society. They, they re-invoked the whole notion of Kosovo. Scientists were probably most effective in making this plausible. Mm. They were, uh, in, the media were filled with reports on Serbian atrocities committed by uh, uh, Bosnian as well as Albanian um, uh, ethnic people in, in several parts of Yugoslavia, which just well, definitely was bullshit, but still it was uh, uh, utmost effective. But the result was not that people believed him, and, it's, and uh, it is definitely not true that the Serbian people would vote, would have voted for Milosevic, that definitely you find in almost any depiction of what happened. Um, but I think that people were just, uh, st they were uh, put in awe from, from by all these reports, let's say, um, and uh, by the shortness of time, let's say, in which that happened, what, I, what you could call with Nietzsche as Umstürzung der Werte or with, with Scheler as, um, he used a similar word, uh, as Umkehrung der Werte, so it is a whole reversal of the cultural matrix, let's say. And Durkheim hinted us at the, the effects that can result from these, um, uh, from the perception of anomie, of anomia. And uh, only on this level you could actually, um, well, leave a devastated people without any orientation, ready not even to oppose a going to war. But as I said, my main point would be that we have to apply much more complex theoretical and empirical means to, to show the mediation effect uh, when it comes to how uh, s such a general complex as the Kosovo myth has, is transmitted uh, in, uh, into real life. I guess I should stop. Yeah. Thank you.